All right, let's go ahead and start. We've got chapter 11 this week, actually. We should get it done today. Subnetting, probably we'll do that on Wednesday, just the last part of the chapter. That we'll talk first part on the disk, something like that was two chapters. I kind of thought that was two different chapters. So we're going to talk about IP version 4. There is IP version 6, which is in the next chapter, which is what we're moving towards now. But we've been moving there for 20 years. Okay, but we're moving a lot more rapidly now towards IP version 6. IP version 4 pretty much goes back to about 1980, if I've got date on it, um, but it's way on back there. And when it was set up, remember, it was pre-World Wide Web. So how they set it up, they had no vision of where we are today. And of that being there in 13 years from when they were making it. Okay? They might have think thought we'd be there now, but not just 13 years after their development of it. And then spring is starting to bother my sinuses. Usually by this week, I've already had a real bad sinus attack. Because last year, last week, I was really bad off of the sinus attack. Because um, I was in North Carolina at a conference and it was, I was hurting for the night week. And then the sound abrupt and everything else. And people were concerned whether I had COVID. And if you remember, we shut down this past weekend a year ago. So, and usually it hits me in the spring and fall, but so far I've done pretty well. So, off of that, they came up with a system to set up addresses and to get up in some organization out there so that you can get all of these different computer systems to work together was the idea. Because the internet had been around for a little while at that point, for about 10 years. IP version 1, 2, and 3 obviously had appeared gone. Don't ask me what the difference was about them because I don't know anything about IP version 1, 2, or 3. Okay? But then four, they came up with this nice naming scheme and developed it. With the system they came up with, it worked fine when you just had limited, not everybody trying to get on the internet. Okay. When you moved to the World Wide Web, the whole situation changed. 
That's what they did when they developed it. They came up with an address that was four bytes long. They put them in octets, is what they called it, and still call it. So you've got octets there. Um, so they were each one byte long, and then they expressed it in decimal numbers. And that's addresses that y'all are used to seeing when somebody talks about IP addresses quite often. That you'll see numbers like 192, 168, 3.1. Two point one sixty eight point three point one. Okay, y'all follow on that. Now, each one of those numbers takes up one byte, which we've seen when we've looked at the packet already. When we've mentioned that, although we really haven't, yeah, we've um, gone through the packet already. That we've seen where it took one byte, one byte for each part of that, and that was four bytes long. As part of it also, what they did was that they created that address and it being on this four bytes and when they expressed them, they separated them with periods. Now what's literally stored in the computer is literally just four bytes of information with no periods behind it. It's when it gets displayed out for us to look at it as periods. Okay? Is that they took that and split it to group it. And so they made a portion of it that gave the network address and a portion that told us which host it was. So the network address would tell us which network it's on. And the host portion tells us which specific machine is it on that network. Okay, does everybody follow on that? Now, so as they did that, they also grouped the addresses. And they came up with five different groupings, which they called classes. And so there's five classes of addresses that they would give out. And they grouped them on that. Now, because they grouped them as those classes, they actually ended up wasting a huge number of addresses. But at that point, they weren't real worried about it because they split them into five groups that were supposed to solve, serve five different purposes, okay? And that those groups would have some specific things. And they just took it on an easy basis of we've got those four octets and that we could just split it on the octet band boundary. But depending on what class you were in, you could actually tell according to that when you knew which class they were in, that told you which part of that address is the host portion, which part's the network portion. So as a part of that, they did also, so they came up with classes A, B, C, D, and E. To be able to identify who's the addresses for four parts. To be able to identify those different parts, if it was on a class boundary, which is what they saw it all occurring as when they created it, we'll see some changes we can do to it later, is that if it was a class A address, they said, okay. First octet will tell us what network it is, and the other three octets will tell us which host it is on that network. So it had a network host 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 approach. A class B address has on it that the first two octets tell us which network it is, and then the last two tell us which host it is. So in that case, it's a network point, network point, host point, host. Class C is the first three and a host. 
Now, class D and class E don't quite fit exactly on that, but they're special situations. Class D is for multicast addresses. Okay? And so it's where we're sending it to groups out there. So that one didn't fall into that and was special and used for multicast. Class E, which you won't always see mentioned in books, is the area that they left as either experimental or, remember the military is the one that developed the internet, place for the military to put stuff out there, so for military addressing and special purposes, or that um, apparently the um, CIA, NSA, etc. use addresses in that range also. Okay? So that one was a special one, and it was the leftover addresses, and they just made it into that category and reserved them out, partly to be doing experiments to figure out better ways to work with the Internet, and also for the military to do their correspondence on, which included intelligence work. Okay. Now, I have never seen a class E address in use. But then if I had seen one, I probably couldn't tell you that I've seen one anyway. Okay? Because a lot of it is top secret stuff out there. So then you look at my statements that I may or may not have seen one, but I can't tell you I've seen one. Okay? But I haven't seen one. So we follow on that. So you probably aren't going to see a class E address out there. A lot of books don't even mention class E. A lot of times you just see there's class A, B, C, and D. So we follow on that. Now, the other part is on this, because of this setup right here, what they came up with was subnet mask to be able to identify which part is the host and which part is the network. So then you would send that IP address and you put a subnet mask with it also, which you will also actually do in IP version 6. IP version 6 is not going to have addresses, have classes like that. Okay? Though it will have some grouping, but it's not going to have classes as such. Okay? But it does have several things reserved out there. So, subnet mask, what it shows is it tells you what part of the address is the network portion and which part is the host portion. Now, what it does, what you do with it is, in the network portion of the address, you put binary ones. In the host portion, you put binary zeros. So a subnet mask always starts with binary ones, and it always ends with binary zeros. Everybody follow on that? Now the question is, how many of each of those is there in there? Because then you can use the subnet mask laid with the IP address, and you would be able to identify how much is the network portion and how much of it is the host portion. That works from the original concept on completely class-based out there for your requestable addresses to today where we now don't follow exactly on these rules, but we can extend it some on over. So what looks like host portion here, nowadays network portion can go into the host portion. The network can borrow bits in the host portion. Okay, And that's what the last half of the chapter gets into. So, under the original concept there of purely class addresses, the subnet mask for class A was 255.0.0.0. 255, remember back when we covered binary addresses in our conversion, if we convert one byte of all ones, to a decimal number, we're going to get 255. Because that's eight binary numbers. Everybody follow on that? So 
one into one is two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, and one twenty-eight. Okay, so that's where the two fifty-five comes from. And then in the other three bytes where it's just host, it's just zeros. But in that case, there's twenty-four zeros sitting there. Okay. Now you will see it also expressed nowadays in shorthand fashion. Or they'll just stick it on the end of the address with a slash and the number of bits. That's the network portion. And actually, IP version 6 is going to use that approach also. Okay? It's not going to use this long hand portion. However, if you go to program root Cisco routers, unlike which we did in the previous chapter, <coughs> or switches, and we go to put the IP address in. You have to put the subnet mask in also, as you all know by now. But you have to do it in longhand format. So you have to do it in this format. Okay? You can't do it in this. Although they will tell you a lot of times what it is in this format, in the shorthand. But when you go to enter it, you have to enter it longhand. For B, it would be 255, about 255. Dot zero dot zero or slash sixteen. C would be two fifty five two fifty five two fifty five up zero or slash twenty four. And remember there's thirty two bits in there. So whatever you've got as a slash tells you if you subtract that from thirty two tells you how many bits you've got there for the host. Okay, so that's the subnet net mask. And all we're going to do is take an address and lay it against the subnet mask, and that will then tell us what portion of it is the network portion and what portion is the host portion. And you quite often will have a question asking you. That may appear on a test, may appear on a certification test, that's going to give you an address. And the subnet mask and ask you what is the network address for that address? And that one, what would it be? Can you repeat the question, please? The 192, right? Uh -huh. Point what? 168. Four. Point what? Four. Four. Point what? Two. Zero. Oh, yeah. Because we don't have anything in those last bits or that last byte in the network portion. So the network address here. There's 192, 168, oops, 0.4, 0.0. Okay. Everybody follow that? Now, network addresses, when they ask you about a network address, they'll give you one that always has zero in the host portion. Okay. So if it's zero, host zero is always the network address. So we follow on that? So, and when we say on zero on that, that's actually all binary zeros in the host portion. I'll follow? The last one, it means it's a zero in decimal also. But when we get to looking at subnetting later in the chapter, we'll see that changes slightly, but it still follows the rule of it's all zeros in the host portion. And all we're doing is, is looking at this, and since this one, these at this point are purely on class boundaries, we can just look and see where all the 255s are and use just those octets. 
Now, when we get to the last portion of the chapter on Wednesday, we're going to have to break this down into binary ones. But at least where we start having different numbers in 255, it's the first part of B255, so we don't have to break them down. We know that part is. But then when we get to different, we'll have to break it down into binary ones to see exactly where the line is and break that into binary ones also. And then we can switch it down and then put it back into decimal. The other address is that we'll have broadcast address. So the network one is always all binaries in the area. It's always all binary zero in the host. Okay? On the network address. There's a broadcast address also reserved out there. And that is where we have all ones. That's binary ones. In the host. Okay, so in this case, where we're looking at that, we've got an address of 192.168.4.0. That is 192.168.4 is the network portion. <coughs> Point zero is the network address. The broadcast address in this case would be 192.168.4.255. And if it has that address on there, because it's a broadcast one, that means that that has an address, and that would only be on a destination, it would not be on a source, that that's to go to every machine. So when each machine gets it, they'll look at it and go, oh, that belongs to me. And every one of them will say, it belongs to me. Don't follow on that. So if you want to send a message to every node on your network, you put all binary ones in the host portion, or in the case of this doing it on a class basis, we put 255 there. Okay? That's that part now. So the subnet is just a way to pull it out. For right now, pretty much in the first part of the chapter, we're looking at it that it's 255s in the subnet. You know, that is the network portion. If it's zeros, that's the host portion. I'll follow. Now, in the second part of the chapter, we're going to complicate that some. We're going to come up with some other numbers. Now, when I got the MCSE, which is Microsoft's, what was their top networking certification? Now they don't have one anymore. Um, that was as far as I understood it. Okay, when I started into this class that y'all are taking now, that's when they threw at me what we're going to get in the second half of the chapter. And Microsoft never told me about it. Okay? But yet you need to know it. So, I have described to you the prefixes and the subject basket. Okay? Now, they go through in the chapter to determine the network portion and the host portion of the address compared to the subnet mask. They go through and do logical ending, and they spend a page or two on that. Okay? About a page and a half explaining that one, too. That's not the system I use to figure out what's the network portion of that address and what's the host portion, okay? In the first case, at the point where they're at right now, you really don't need it, okay? When you're using just classical addresses. We get into the second part of the chapter and get to subnet. Yes, you're gonna to have to compare them with binary, the binary numbers to figure it out. But you really don't need to go through and do logical painting. You're just going to compare numbers on it. 
a poll on that. A logical ending says we have to sit there and look and go, if it's a one and it's a one, then that means the one. If it's a one and a zero, because it's an and, then that means it has to be a zero. If it's a zero and it's a one, it has to be a zero. Okay. I think we can get it right. Yeah. And that you do that all and are doing all kinds of that binary arithmetic on, basically. Okay. That you're doing a logical operation on and doing and. And anding says if it's if there's a zero in there, the answer is zero. Both of them have to be one for it to be a one. If it did a logical or instead, which is not covered here, a logical or takes the opposite approach. If there's a one anywhere in there, it's a one. And it has to be, both of them have to be zero for it to be zero. Okay? But as we go through it, when we get to submitting on Wednesday, or we may touch on time for today. Um, but we'd probably rather not get that deep today, so we may just end early today, okay? Because y'all need to just get the concepts of how IP version 4 is set up, really, at this point. Well, let's not start complicating it today, but you just sit on that for a day, and then we'll make the complications. But when we're looking at the whole ones, the easiest thing to do is look at the subnet mask. And as long as it's purely on class boundaries, and where it just has two fives and zeros in the subnet mask, all you have to do is look and see, all right, columns that have, or bytes that have decimal zeros in there, that's the host portion. Sections that have decimal 255s in them is the network portion. Or you can look at it of uh, portions that have eight binary ones in them, that's, then that's the network portion, and portions that have eight binary zeros in them is the host portion. Does every follow on that part? And you don't have to sit there and do all of this calculating that they did on the page or two right there, okay? So, but the other part is, keep in mind, network addresses always end in binary zeros in the host portion. And right now, where we're on class boundaries, it means it's got a zero in the host portion, okay? Even in decimal. Broadcast addresses is the highest address in that network. And in that case, it's where the host is all binary ones, the host address portion of it. And when we're on class boundaries, that means it's 255 in the host area. Okay? Now, keep in mind, subnet mask is working a little backwards. Okay? From what you're looking otherwise. But it's just a way to pull stuff out there. Okay. That means two of our addresses are gone in each class. So if I issue you a class C address, you've got this last octet to put addresses in for your host, and every host has to have a different address. Okay. But zero and 255 are gone. So you can't use those two. Do we follow on that? So on a unicast address, there'll be anything except those two. Okay, and it's a specific address of a machine. For on unicast, we're sending it to one specific machine. So a unicast address has a specific machine's address, which is what you do most of the time, okay? This you're sending it to one device. A broadcast address, which we said it's all binary ones in the host, or 255 in the host, 
your own class. And that's where you're sending a message that goes to every machine on your network. Okay? There is a lot of stuff that occurs out there internally in the network that is broadcast. Okay? DHCP, when we talked about it already, okay, to get an address for your computer instead of you having assigned to your machine that you're keeping them centrally on a server and sharing them out so you don't have to have as many addresses. You only have to have as many addresses as you'll have machines turned on at any point. Okay? Also means that you don't have to go out and manage and remember which one's assigned to each machine. And if somebody comes in and messes with the address, as soon as it's turned off and turned on, it straightens itself back out. Okay? Um, and it assigns other information with you also. However, what DHCP does is the first message when that machine is turned on, so Nathaniel turns on his machine, the first thing it does, because actually it is using DHCP in here, it sends a request out. It does not know where the DHCP server is. It doesn't know what its address is. All it knows is it's been set up with automatic addressing. And it goes, okay, that means I need a DHCP server to give me an address. It does not know what the address for that server is. So what's the only thing it can do? It's got to send a broadcast. It can't send a unicast message out. It doesn't know the address. But it sends a broadcast and says, this is a DHCP message requesting an address. <coughs> and sends it. And any DHCP server on the network then responds to it. Normally you got one DHCP server on your network. You can have more than one. That's the second thing on why it's got to be a broadcast, okay? But you really wouldn't want to build in there if you could the address of the DHCP server because I could change. The DHCP server then replies back and says, okay, I've got an address to offer you. What kind of message is it going to have to send back? That you Unicast or broadcast? Unicast. Hmm? Unicast? Is it Unicast? Can it send a unicast address back offering an address for that machine to use? Does it know the address of that machine? No. So the only thing it can do is broadcast it back out because it doesn't know where this is going. Okay? If you're in a crowded place and they're needing to get the attention of one person in that whole crowd, if you're in Walmart, and the person you're supposed to write home with decides they're going to wait. What do they do? It's not. Nowadays, ideally, they know what your phone number is and call your cell phone, right? But if they, you don't have a cell phone on you, what do they do? They go to the service desk and say, Will you page Susie and tell her her rights for you? And we hear that occasionally in Walmart, right? They come on the speaker system, and they've made a broadcast to everybody in the store that Susie's right is leaving. I forgot to put it on fire So it's a broadcast at that point, okay? So that's all the broadcast is, okay? You don't know... You send it to everybody, not just to one person. And so when announcements go over the PA, that's a broadcast out there, okay? Um, versus if they call you and tell you the message, that's been a unicast, okay? And that one was probably a broadcast message, actually, because I didn't recognize the number on it. And more than likely, it was telling me that they think my car warrant case expired. And they've been trying to contact me. I did have fun with them one day. I went ahead 
went to talk to him. He told him I was interested in getting one. I mean, what kind of car have you got? And how many miles have you got? It was a 2001 Saturn, and it's got 790,000 miles on it. What did he say again? 2001 Saturn, 790,000 miles. And I didn't get any further than that, and all I heard was click. I don't understand that. And I forgot to tell my mechanic the other day, have those people quit calling me because actually my car now it does have an 18 month warranty, an 18 month warranty on the motor because they just replaced the motor in it. And the replacement motor actually comes with an 18 month unlimited mileage warranty. So actually that car does have a warranty on it now. Um, but um, I was curious to see what the world they were going to tell. So in any event, on that DHCP return from the server, it's got to be a broadcast also. Now, that serves actually two purposes on DHCP. One is the machine that needs an address gets the message. Okay. Second one is every other machine sees the message also. And if by chance some machine is using that address for some reason, somebody put it into it instead of letting it use DHCP, it will respond and tell DHCP for no, you can't use that address. I'm already using it. Because you can't have two machines with the same address on your network. Okay? So broadcasts do get used out there. The devices regularly send messages back and forth to each other. If you remember where we've already seen mentioned that the devices are out there talking in the background. Not stuff that we're sending across, but just talking to each other to figure out where they all are. And that they're continuously telling each other information about the different devices all hooked up which makes it work faster when we go to send something because then they know where to send it. They know, does that machine exist or not exist? Okay. So the majority of your network traffic's not stuff being sent across that people are wanting to use. It's actually the machines just talking with themselves. And think about your own talking, your own communication. How much of your communication is it that you're not doing about spreading information or taking listening to your instructor or taking the test, but where you're doing other things to fulfill yourself better or things that you need to know at home. That you sit there and talk to yourself at times. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And that goes on all the time, right? And that you're continuously thinking of different things. And it might be how, when you get on that game the next time, what are you going to do next time you play it, okay? And that you're not telling anybody that, that you're communicating that back and forth with yourself. So you're running a continuous thing. Or you're driving down the road and you're monitoring everything that's happening out there on the road. But you're not telling anybody else in the car, if there's other people in the car with you, exactly everything you see occurring. Now, something really unusual occurs, yeah, you do tell everybody else about it, okay? But most things, you're observing it and you're processing it in your brain and taking appropriate action. Okay? But when somebody, something else really crazy happens out there or whatever, yeah, you share that one. But most of it you don't. You just react and keep on going. And just put it in your mind. All right, that car just did something a little odd, so. Keep that in the back of your mind as you continue following it, expecting that when something else is going to happen, going, they're not going to do what I would normally expect them to do, so I've got to be prepared for that one. And that way we keep ourselves out of accidents. Because there's a lot of dumb drivers out there on the road. So those happen all the time out there. So DHCP starts off with broadcast. And it finishes up with a directed unicast message. Because then when a machine chooses to use it, 
that then both machines know who they are so they don't have to broadcast everybody. Multicast has the advantage of we can send one message out that goes to a number of machines. Streaming is a good example of multicast. Okay? So we don't have to send to everybody that's listening to that same thing a separate feed on it going out and fill up our network with all of these different feeds of identically the same thing going across. Don't follow all that. We can send it to the whole group of them, just one feed. <coughs> Keeps our network traffic down, which means our network can now run faster because the road stays clear. Okay? So multicast works really well on that. Now, where is the front of the thing? Okay, then I'm going to jump a little forward in the chapter and I'll come backwards. Because here's the next thing I want to talk about is on our class addresses here. Back into space. Class A addresses. And this is where the problem with IP version 4 comes in. Okay? Is the number of networks we've got on each one of these and the number of hosts per network. I'll follow on that. So back when we were running purely a normal IP version 4 as it was designed on class basis, which was up till the late 90s. They issued you a class A, B, or C address that gave you so many network, so many hosts that you could put on your network. So if you wanted to put a, a network out there onto the internet, you apply to one of those regional authorities which I showed you in the book. In America, you apply to Aaron, A R I N, which is the American Registry for Internet Numbers. Other parts of the world got other groups that issue it, and they all work together under a central authority. And they issued you one address, a network address. Okay? And then that gave you. That many hosts that they gave of type of address they gave. So one of your items when you had to put in was how many host addresses were you need? And they issued a class A, B, or C. Class A had 128 possible networks. So there's only 128 organizations in the world could get a class A address. Okay? And actually, that's wrong. It's possible that it was 128, but it actually turns out that the designers of the system cut that down to 127. Okay, that is a slash 127. You'll see it mentioned both ways sometimes. The book went with 128. Okay. That gave you for number of hosts on each one of those networks, because they had three bytes here. Now remember, it's going to go to, if you're going on bits to convert on it, that gets to 128. And there's 256, 512, 1024, so on up through 24 bits. Y'all follow on that? Y'all see where those numbers climb astronomically. That gave you 16 million host addresses. And you really only need to remember 16 million. The book tells you with the exact number of 16,777,214. But any test I've ever seen, as long as you know it was 16 million, you're in good shape. They may give you the exact number, but they're never going to ask you. About 15,999 versus 
777,214. If you know 16 million in that range, you'll get the right number out of it. The other numbers aren't going to be close to that. Okay? Y'all follow all that? Actually, what they'll usually do is give you all three answers I've got here, and all you got to remember is which one of the three it was. And then some other random number thrown in there. Okay? And as long as you've got the approximate number on it, you'll have the right one out of the list. Because the other numbers won't be right there with it. Same goes for this number here. Whether it's 128 or 127, if it's got 128 or it's got 127 as your answers, you'll go with that one. It just depends on the person on how, which number they choose to use with. And I'll explain that one in a second to you about where that one goes to, okay? What that one network was specially used for and still she's specially used for. And actually, y'all have used it already. And Ms. West has probably mentioned it in the other class to you several times also. Okay, so, and it, on IP version 6, it's the one thing I can tell you what the, IP, the actual address is for an IP version 6, because they didn't waste it in IP version 6. Class B has 16,384 networks. So these are smaller networks. This one's for large networks. AT&T got one of those addresses. IBM, I believe, got one. And I'm not sure who else got them. But you got to remember, they were the big computer companies back in the 80s. Okay? As far as I know, I believe it is, AT&T still has one of those addresses. The rest of them, it's all changed under the button. I think it was AT&T went to court and fought to keep their address. Because they goofed up when they issued them back originally. And they didn't lease them out to organizations. They gave you an address. So you owned it at that point. And when they then asked everybody to give up addresses so they could do like we're going to do in the last half of the chapter, AT&T said, no, we're not giving it up. And it was a court battle on it in at and one And they get to keep using that address. Okay? But they don't need 16 million hosts. So in class B, there's 65,534 hosts. Now, I would tell you this also on both of these. 65,000 is enough of a number you just got to remember on that. You don't need to remember the whole number. Okay? Same thing here, 16,000. My experience has been always been able to answer the question for me. I don't have to try to remember that whole down to the order number. Class C, which was for small organizations, and supposed to be the most common one out there, has 2 million. 97,152. Two million is all I remember on it. Networks. Because that's what most networks are going to be. I'll call on that. And it has 254 posts. Per network. And I'll show you exactly how that one works in a second. So that was what those were set up as, and they issued the mails through the late 90s. So when we suddenly ran out of addresses, at least theoretically ran out of addresses. Okay? First issue was. We ran out of addresses because any organization that got one of those addresses had addresses for 16 million hosts. How many organizations, even today in the world, do you know that would have a need for 16 million or even 10 million host addresses on their network? 
found anybody that I really know of, okay? That would put it all on one network. No problem on that. Federal government probably does, but they're not using one network. Each of the departments of the federal government has got their own network, and agencies within it got their own network. They're not all sitting on one massive network. Now follow on that. So, huge amount of waste there. If your network did have more than 65,534 hosts on it, guess what? If your network was only has 65,535 hosts on it, what did you have to get? A class A address with 16 million addresses. Now, does that sound like a very efficient use of addressing? Not really. And your smallest one has 254 hosts on it. Now, keep in mind today, we've got networks everywhere. You've got a network at home, and there is a network address assigned to you. If you're connected to an ISP and have internet, you've actually got a network address there. Now they give you a partial one, but you got issued a network address. Now, when we first were doing connecting in back there in the early 90s to the internet, from 93 to 95, 96, not a big problem. How many computers did people have in their house if they had a computer? One. No big problem. You didn't assign them a network. They were just an attachment on your ISP's network. But there weren't multiple ones trying to share it right there. So they, they were just a node on the ISP. So Ringgold Telephones Network and all of the houses that were attached to it. I'll follow on that. Comcast local office had all the ones that were just locally connected. And it probably had a class D address. Okay. Now, what have you got in your house? How many devices have you got hooked to the net to a network? Any number of them out there, okay? Because you've probably got several computers sitting there in the house. Okay. You've got phones attached to it. You've got other devices attached to it. Your appliances in the kitchen may be all attached. There's thermostat in the hall. Light bulbs through your house, they may be attached on the network so that you can dim them and brighten them off the computer. Okay, you turn them off and on. The grill in your backyard may be on the network so that when you're out on the road, you can fire up the grill before you get home so you all, it's already hot and ready for you to just. Take that steak you just bought at the grocery store out of the wrapper and throw it on the grill. Not real sure what that accomplishes on it, but you can actually buy those grills that I know some people have and have turned them on from elsewhere. Well, I'm not sure that's a real good practice because you don't know what else may have gotten on it. And the cat's laying on top of it, you may have just set the cat on fire, and now who knows what all you set on fire when the cat runs all over the place burning. So I'd be real careful when doing some of these things on it. But you've got a ring doorbell. You've got a ring doorbell, you can pull it up here at school. And Nathaniel can get a text saying there's somebody that is seeing or decides to just see that he thinks there may be a problem in his yard right now. He can bring up the ring doorbell on his phone or on the computer and look at what's happening in the front yard from wherever he is sitting in the world. I was sitting in Frisco, Texas, when the instructor was demonstrating the ring doorbell to us, and he demonstrated his that was in Omaha, Nebraska. And then he was trying to figure out why in the world was the front door open at that point. When he went in to demonstrate how the thing worked and discovered the front door of his house was sitting there wide open. <coughs> Turned out his wife was bringing in groceries. But he went into a panty cart. Um, so, Lots of things hooked on there. When I was at Swain's World Tech in 1990, I think it was 90, give or take a year, we hooked onto, we stuff put 
banner in your student reference system here. And it was attaching all of the tech schools together in, through the central, to the central office in Atlanta using the internet. Free World Wide Web, so hardly anybody was using. So they gave all of us, got all of us got a network address. There at the school, we were handed a Class C address. Northwestern Tech, predecessor to UTC, on the north end here, got given an address too. Coosa Valley, got what we're given one also. 254 addresses each of the schools. Our question was sitting in that meeting that day of the 30 of us or whatever, representing the, at that time about 30 tech schools. 25 of them now, because they merged on that, et cetera, and created a few new ones and done mergers. We all looked at each other and said, what are we ever going to use 254 addresses for? Because the only use we saw for them was our machine in our office, one or two machines in the front office of the school, and maybe another one, and one or two machines for some students to get on and see what the internet is. And what were we ever going to use? And maybe the forward thinking schools are going, well, it'd be really nice to hook up all the machines in one computer lab to the internet so the students could go in there of a whole class and see how they could go out on the internet and find things. So that was before web pages, okay? So you needed to know the IP address to go to everything. And that was all we could see that we could ever use them for. And well, what in the world would we ever need 254 addresses for? By the time 1996 rolled around, the issue was, what are we going to do now? Because now we've got every faculty member with an IP address on their machine. And we're setting up labs all over the place with IP addresses. So we get through this building right here, just this campus and this small campus. And we're going to have more than 254 addresses used right here. We may even use more than 254 addresses on this one floor. Okay? Let's think about it. There's 14 machines in here. There's a printer. You've got, what, seven or eight machines in the back of the room that can have addresses. The next two rooms, I've got 20 machines in each of them. Plus, in the back of the next room, we've got routers and stuff set up in there that can all, that all have addresses to be able to talk. We've got a number of offices. We've got the room across the hall, I know, has got 20 machines in the middle. Well, if you add it up real quick right there, we're already approaching 100 machines, and we haven't even gotten halfway down the hall yet. Y'all see what I'm saying? The other thing is, all of us have got a cell phone sitting in our pocket. You know I've got one now, because um, we had it a few minutes ago. And they're almost all connected to the Internet, too, and that we've connected to the school's Internet, so it gave us an address. And we're using a school IP address on our phone. And who knows how many students we've got scattered down the hall right now. Well, right now, probably y'all have maybe one of the class at desk, but I don't even think there's any others down the hall. But in normal times, we may have four classes of people sitting down the hall or two, right? And you can see where that doesn't work very well. But from the home place, you may have just two or three things at home on there, or you may have a whole bunch of things on there. Probably most of us have only got four or five items at home that are connected to the network. Okay? Now, if we go like visit Bill Gates, his whole house is all IP addressed all through it. So that we can walk through it that it's program and you walk through it that as you walk from room to room, and no, I haven't been in this house. Um, I've never met him. I've gotten to meet some other pioneers and computers, but I've never met him. Um, as you walk from room to room, the TVs pick up a signal off you using IP addressing. 
and the TV switched to whatever show you were watching as you walked from room to room through the house. That's what all the reports say. So if you're sitting in here watching TV and you got to go to the bathroom, probably a TV sitting in the bathroom that you can continue watching while you're sitting in the bathroom. You don't have to change the channel to pick up the same show you were watching. So Friday night when I'm watching the one trip NCAA basketball game. So that's where I graduated from. And I actually went to their very first home basketball game they ever had back in 1978. Um, if I got to get up and go to the bathroom during the day, I wouldn't even have to miss anything. Because as I walked out in the hall, probably a flat screen TV sitting there, and it would switch to that channel, and I'd keep right on watching it. Walk right on through. Don't follow all that. Ton of IP addressing through. The rest of us quite aren't that way yet. If we went and started at Warner and Buffett, probably along the same line, but I'm not sure if he's really on technology on that. But Bill Gates definitely has. <coughs> Paul Allen's widow and Steve Jobs' widow, definitely. It's going to be the same thing. Okay? Um, Wozniak, I'm quite sure, would be the same way. The other guy that founded Apple was Steve Jobs. And I'm really sure on him that he'd be the latest on all of that compared to the others we just named. Because he's the one that pushes music concerts and all kinds of stuff in music. And he'd want it where you could keep watching the same concert you were watching all the way through. You could all kinds of weird things. So you had those assigned there. Lots of wastage. But that's where they fit into. Okay? They show you in the graph that class D and E actually, they've got the same amount of space as. C does on it. Okay? But 50% of all addressing went right here. Okay? And then the rest of it made up 50%. So grossly inefficient. Beyond that, they also made public and private addresses. So I'm going to erase the first part right here. And they did public and private addresses. The idea was that when they did it, was if you were connecting to the internet, if you were going to actually be connected out there, you would have a public address. And every device in the world had to have a uniquely different IP address back then. Okay? So if you were connected to the internet, you had to have a public address. If you weren't connecting your network to the internet, the idea was you would use a private address. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you weren't connecting to the internet, you could use whatever numbers you wanted to use anyway because. You weren't connected to the internet, so it never, nobody would ever see your address anyway. But that was the theory, okay? And apparently a lot of people didn't follow it. Um, it's come in handy for us today because they gave us something to do when we ran out of addresses. But they then figured out something there in the late 90s as we were running out of addresses. I was like, wait a minute, we got these private addresses and we can play games. So, class A for private addresses, for public addresses, first thing, a public and private. This was anything that had a host address of one. So 127, or maybe 126. Okay. 
private addresses had come out of that range. So they pulled one thing out of that range. Anything that starts with Tim And these went on to the XXX on, on the end of the cut. So that was the first object. Anything start with 10 was a private address. You're going to find a lot of times that when you used to do. I think that's actually what they use in here, but I'm not sure. Class B would be any addresses. Those these went from one twenty eight to one ninety one. Okay. These went from here to 127. C went from 192 to 223. So in binary, this one started with a 11 one one zero and then the rest of the bytes bits. This one started with one zero and the rest of the bits. This one started zero and then the rest of the bits. Class D actually starts with one 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 and a zero. It goes from 224. <laughs> Two thirty nine. Then this one will go to two thirty nine to two fifty four. It starts at one 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 zero. Okay. But that's where these numbers are coming from, is that they did it from binary. Because when you look at these numbers, if you're like me, they didn't tell me about this part. This gave me this list of numbers. Well, where in the world did you come up with those numbers from? And for the longest time I didn't know. I just had to memorize those numbers. Now, for the private addresses, B uses 172.16.xx through 172.31.1. .xx. That's going to be the hard one to remember. It's just got a range of numbers. The biggest part to remember on though is if you remember 172, you're usually safe. Okay? 10 for A, 172 for B. And C is 192.168. And then anything on the end. Okay? Now following that, you need to know this private addresses. If you noticed when I've given you examples quite often. And when you think about now the examples you see in the books and everything, that's the addresses they use. Because they don't belong to anybody. You're giving fictitious addresses. 
that private address is similar to, if you've not ever noticed this, but telephone numbers and movies and everything else. What's the telephone number always start with? Um, hmm? The what three numbers does it start with? Whatever the area. Five, five, five. Okay. Watch on there when you're watching a TV show or whatever where it's not a real number, but it's supposed to be a real number in the TV show or on the movie you're watching. But they're going to always start at 555. Because the 555 exchange does not exist. They've typically kept it as a private system. Now, there is a song from the 1960s. Don't ask me what the phone number is on it again, but it actually used a real number and everybody that gets issued that number occasionally goes crazy and after a month or two he's calling the telephone company going, you've got to give me another number. Because people will listen to that song and call that number. Okay? Which is the reason if you're going to be putting a number fictitiously and stuff, you're supposed to use 555 as the exchange. So everybody follow on that? And so you can look real. 555, 1234, 555, 2351, whatever. You can call it, it won't go anywhere, okay? Because y'all all pull out your cell phones and try it, right? Um, but that's the same idea here. These were for use in the organization and not for use, not for real use, but for. Now, what we're using them today for, and I'll come back to this one and see because we're out of time is we actually now have the ability to put proxy servers or NAT servers between our network and the outside world. We use one address for the whole school. And all of these machines in here can use private addresses, so we're not using up addresses in the world. Those can use multiple places, but when it goes out into the real world, it converts it to a public address. There's only one on the school for that and gets sent out and then comes back if it's converted back to the correct private address is to the correct machine. Freed up a whole lot of addresses. Everybody follow on that? Y'all get the idea? So we really got through two where subnetting starts. That's the basics of IP version 4. Subnetting gets a little bit hard. You know, and actually erase that whole board on Wednesday to cover one. We're going to use the whole board. This is the lecture I need board all the way down the wall. And if you're over down to convince the administration that it's okay for me to draw on the wall, we can work that. But they're going to have to tell me that I can draw on the wall about the control. Um, and we'll go through that on Wednesday. Okay? Any questions on that? I'll get the idea of what IP version 4 is, how it works. Do know this basic information in a table right there. Those can appear for questions on you in the way I told you. You don't need to remember specific numbers, which I didn't even give you called specific number on it. Remember in the broad terms. And you should be able to. My experience has been I've always been able to find the right answer, just know it back. Okay? You need to know these. Private addresses, you need to know what the address range is. Okay? So make sure you remember that. I will see you Wednesday. Have a good couple of days. I'd say have fun outside, but I think it's supposed to rain all this week from what I saw on the forecast yesterday after a pretty weekend. So that gives you plenty of time to stay. Can't go outside, you can sit in there and stay. Um, I know you are so you want to sit there and study for the computer all the time. Right? Even if you're not, you're supposed to tell your instructor yes. That you're living for studying for computers.
I got to go back and watch the scene. I'll probably find it there. Make sure I got to mark here. Which I think I did. I should have, because you came in for a mark of tennis, don't mind. Because I marked attendance after I started this, and you were already yeah, here when I got this finished working.